Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 11th and the final lecture in our online lecture series, Mobility Analysis and Planning for Human Scale Cities. The series has featured several recognized scholars and experts worldwide. Thanks to the support from the Erasmus Plus Jean Monnet Network Action Cooperative, Connected and Automated Mobility, EU and Australasian Innovations. You may access the recordings of all these fascinating talks, some of them in English and a few also in Estonian language, by visiting the lecture series website, transportplanning.ut.ee. Today, it is our pleasure to welcome here Dr. Jochen Wendel from Init, Germany. Jochen holds a PhD in Geography from the University of Colorado Boulder, USA, and a master's degree in Geomatics from the Karlsruhe University of Applied Sciences, Germany. Currently, Jochen is an R&D manager in the research team at INIT, which is a worldwide supplier of IT solutions for public transit. Jochen's work focuses on novel advancements in the public transit sector, including digitalization, data and analytics to promote sustainable, connected and seamless mobility. Prior to joining INIT, Jochen has worked on several projects related to smart cities, location-based services, data mining and data visualization with several state agencies and research institutes, both in the US and in Germany. Should you have uh, questions or comments during the lecture, then please post them on chat and we will have the questions and answers, answers session uh, in the end of the lecture. And now, Jochen, the screen will be yours. Thank you, Arge, for the uh, introduction, and thank you, Siri and Arge, for the invitation to give a presentation today in, in, this, in this frame here. Um, I hope you can see my screen now. In my talk today, I want to, would like to give an overview of current um, advancement in public transit, and the focus should be there on, on, um, on public transit in general, and what technologies and sensors and data we use in public transit and how this data could be used for research. And there in this, in this research area, I would like to show three different projects we're working on. One focused on data, another one on services, and another one on integration of multiple systems into a sustainable transport uh, system. And then in the end, I would like to open um, up a discussion about the future of public transit and how it might look like. So let's first start with an overview of public transit. So what is actually public transit? So if you look on Wikipedia or in encyclopedias or definitions, so you can basically say that public transit defines a system of transport for passengers by group travel systems available to the public that is operated and established on routes, fixed prices and fixed schedules. So this definition still stands as today, but there has been quite a few modif um, modifications over time. But if we go back to the early, early days of public transit, we can say that public transit was first launched in the, 19, in the 1600, 1600s in France. And this was basically a service where you had a carriage uh, connected to a horse and people up to six to eight people could ride on this on a scheduled line. So there were already fixed lines, understanding of fixed lines and a basic service. Then in the 1800s, the invention of an omnibus, so a pre-bus, basically a pre-bus that's also still connected to a horse carriage uh, were put into service. And then in 1800s, early 1900s, street streetcars um, and motorized buses were put into service. And then this development, of course, then went further with, with electric vehicles, trains, and also was in line with the advancement in the automotive sector and also in general technical advancements. And then the next breakthrough could basically be in the, in the 2000s, when in Shanghai, the first um, uh, electric bus uh, were put into service. And now I think in China, nearly 90% of all electric, electric public transit buses are run there. And um, since late uh, 2010s, uh, there has been a focus on autonomous shuttles and autonomous driving, which is then again connected to the automotive sector again. 
So if you look at transport in general, so we usually distinguish in transport between cargo and passenger transport. And then in passenger transport, you could define it in between groups of individual transport, our daily car driving trips, for example, and in public transport. And you can see also a dashed line of cargo transport to public transport. And there are some recent developments to integrate this too into public transport, but I'll to this topic uh, a bit later. And then the public transport sector is usually divided into public transport on road, public transport on rail, and then interregional and long distance travel. But if you look at public transport in specific, as today's talk will be on public transport, there's basically the definition between public transit and train. The train are usually um, vehicles that run on a heavy rail line, and there are different rules applied to that. So this is a whole, whole different systems a system. So, and usually in public transport, these are commuter rails and regional train services. Whereas on the public transit side, you have bus services, which usually run on fixed lines. You have this nearly in every town and city. Then you have newer on-demand services, where you can basically order your service, uh, which takes you to a place on, on a fixed line, a non-fixed line. There are two ways to do that, implement that. And then the rail side, you have subways, tram, and special tramways. So there are multiple forms of that. But let's look at how these transport systems are put into cities and how cities are either adapted to these systems or the system is adapted to the city. So it really depends on the region uh, where, you, where, you, where you look at transit, if it's in, in Europe, in Asia, or, or, or in Northern America. But now let's look at, at, at Europe. And uh, there are different rules which apply to the different transit lines. Usually you have a bus and tram service, which you can see here in pink, this is the case of Lyon in France. And in the city centers, these stops are in between 30 meters, in the city boundaries, 350 meters, and the peri-urban areas uh, up to 450 meters. And then if you move to subway and tram services, you have, of course, different distances, higher, larger distances because of different characteristics of these vehicles. But you can also see this on this map here, uh, that the further away you move, from a city center, the further away the stops go, or if you move to a non-inhabited area, the stops are put further into place. And that's also because public transport has to serve basically the public as a means of transport. So you have to place these lines in a certain manner that accomplish that, that basically everyone can access these services. And depending on which service you use, these have different characteristics. And if you think about public transport and compare this to um, to individual motorized traffic, public transport is quite, quite efficient. So here, here's a nice graph from, uh, from CU Delft, which compares the passengers per hours on a traditional normal uh, width of a, of a street lane. And you can see that within an hour, you can have in car mixed traffic, 1,000 to 2,000 people moving. And then if you move, move across this, you can also see that uh, if you move to heavy rail and suburban rail, light rail, these numbers increase significantly. So public transport is actually very efficient in moving people. And as you will see, learn later, it's also a, a very good mean, uh, mean of transport to uh, fulfill, for example, climate um, action goals and uh, mitigate uh, pollution. But what's also interesting, if you look at cyclists and pedestrians, they have quite a high a throughput of, of number of people if you compare this to a car. So this, all these numbers basically also influence new developments in the city. So if you, if, you, if you look at typical transport systems a bit more into detail, so in here you have a type of service which ranges from power transit. These are, these, these, these are on-demand services and, and nowadays these autonomous shuttles which run in cities via bus to tram, tram trains, and subway trains, and commuter trains, you see that depending on which mode you select, you get different expense, which cover a city within 30 minutes, for example. There's an example of Frankfurt in here. You have, in the middle, you have, for example, com commuter trains. Then and on, the, on the left side, you have the tram services. And on the right side, you have um, uh, bus, ser um, paratran uh, sorry, bus services, yes. And you see that all of these, um, uh, types of transport have different characteristics. And depending of your characteristic of your city, you usually put them, you plan according to that. 
So the most flexible one, as you can see here, is for example, of course, most cities have is laid out with streets for the bus. Um, it's very well used within the city. You have, you have stops in between 250 to 500 meters. And, and the same goes with, with trams. And there are special, uh, special developments recently, like for example, tram trains. So tram trains are trams which run also on train lines. And you have a huge variety of, of possibilities to put these into place with stop distances between 300 to 2,500 meters. So you can basically serve the city center and also the carry urban and periphery of, of a city. And as you, as, you, as you look at the average speeds, which is of course also important if you want to have an attractive uh, public transport system, they, they range quite heavily, especially if you look at uh, road transport, because road transport, um, of course, is, is, is very well connected to traffic, individual traffic in general. So you have traffic jams and so on. So you have huge variation in, in speed. And also the average speed compared to the maximum speed is quite high, whereas with rail, you have uh, very constant high speeds and high average speeds. And depending on that, you can also then build the interval of, of your service of these characteristics. And you can see that usually in commuter rails, you have, uh, depending in, in which city you operate and which, which, which uh, in inner city or periphery or outside the city, you have different intervals because these trains usually run on heavy rail and then you have conflicting traffic with high speed uh, rail connections and cargo transport and so on. So besides these traditional systems, which I just uh, showed you, there are also special transport systems which uh, can be applied. So there are ferries, as, as you know, there's, there are bus, bus rapid transit lines. They are really common in the US. You can see this picture up here, this highway. And on this highway, you have dedicated lines. So similar, so these buses basically run in similar fashion as, as a tram or a train. So they have dedicated lines only for buses. So you can reach high average speeds and you can cover high distances. Then you have new developments with air taxis. This is an example of Singapore from Volocopter. They're putting air taxis in, into service there as testing. Then, especially in South America, you have gondolas as a means of public transport. And then you have special operations. This is in Wuppertal in Germany, where you have these um, special construction railways, which in this case run over, over a river line. So there are multiple ways on how to um, basically put public transport systems into place, which really depends on the characteristic of the city. So if you look at transport systems in general, so this is an example of Stockholm and Stockholm has a very well developed public transport system. But what do you usually do with these endpoints and uh, peri-urban areas which are not well connected, even if you have a very well established public transport system as in Stockholm, you can see, for example, um, whoop, um, the area here and the end lines. And there are certain areas in the periphery where you don't have any connections within uh, two or three kilometers or three kilometer range to your main transit line. So in this case, um, there's been a lot of development going on for the first and last mile transport systems. And these are usually called feeder systems. And in the past, this has been on demand services that were really, really popular where you have microbuses running on line services, but also on, on demand services without lines. So you basically call up a, a taxi or a microbus and 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 this, this this microbus then collects the passengers and drives them to the nearest subway station. And recently, you can see this big hype of bike and scooter sharing, and the new services of connected and digitalized services as mobility as a service. I will talk more about this later as an example. And then um, all kinds of inclusion, especially in the U.S. and Asia, with hailing services, for example, Uber you have here, they could use to main transport lines. So as a solution for last mile transport. So if you compare this to the traditional public transport systems, you can see already the shift happening and new modes being integrated into this traditional um, public transport system. So when we talk about public transit in general, usually you distinguish between two kinds of authorities. It really is across Europe and I would say nearly across worldwide. Also the US, Asia, you find these structures. Usually you have a public transport authority and then a public transport provider. So the main difference between these two different types of uh, authorities is basically that the PTA, Public Transport Authority, is the body that articulates the societal demand for public transport and basically operates the tender. So it's usually structured around bigger cities, bigger regions, and the PTAs are responsible to offer services 
from third, uh, from uh, public transport providers. So they, they, they open up tenders and they decide which transport, uh, transport line go, which transport is needed. And then on the other hand, you have the PTOs, the public transport provider. These are basically transportation companies, which operates buses, trains, or any kinds of services. And these licenses are given through public tenders, which the PTA organizes. And then historically, if you think back like 30 years, even less 20 years, um, PTOs are usually then also, also often owned by the municipality itself. And uh, many PTOs themselves yeah, represent this authority. So sometimes it's a bit tricky to distinguish between. But this is a general frame on how, on, on, on how uh, public transport is operated. You see, you have the PTA, which organizes the public transport infrastructure and line, and then the PTO, which operates the vehicles and sometimes also the infrastructure. So if you look at public transport and how it's formed and how cities sometimes are shaped, is this is uh, public transport in, in most countries, especially in the in European Union, Europe, is financed by the state and local authorities. There are other countries which, which these uh, services are, are, are privately operated, but in, if we talk about Europe, these are usually financed by state and local authorities. And usually in most countries, public transport is a public service and is anchored in federal law. So for example, in Germany, we have a federal law which mandates public transport is necessary and has to fulfill certain rules. And in general, if you then again look at the European Union, the goal of public transport is to provide transportation services for every citizen. So that means that the service should be appropriate and similar quality despite of the region. Sometimes it's not very easy, so that's why you have multiple uh, modes of transport, multiple services, multiple types. And then there should be accessibility despite socioeconomic level, which is sometimes also not equally distributed as we know, but this should, public transport should provide this. Then public transport should always be given a priority to motorized individual transport with a big automotive um, lobby in most countries is sometimes overlooked or not very well uh, put into place. And then urban developments, this is actually from a German law, uh, should be aligned with existing public transport services. So if you plan a new neighborhood, in Denmark, for example, same, or in Germany, I guess most countries in the European Union, that uh, this new development should be aligned with existing public transport lines, or they should integrate public transport services in these new neighborhoods. And um, a priority on public transport and should be given on uh, developing new services for specific user groups, so pupils, working population, children, elderly, and people with disabilities. So there's a big mandate in European Union that this public transport have, has to fulfill these. And besides that, public transport also has the goal now to be a main enabler for energy saving and emission reduction. So this is also now anchored in EU law and the EU, EU Green Deal. So there's a lot of pressure put onto <laughs> public transit but it has to fulfill and try and has to uh, yeah, offer. But this also forms a future developments in terms of emission reductions, energy savings and, and urban development. And if you look, if you now broaden this up outside the Europe, you, you can see big differences between, for example, Australia, Asia and Asia, Africa, there's a lot of informal transport there and then North America and Europe. As an example, I would, I would not go worldwide. I would like to give an example between public transport in Europe and North America, because this is quite considerably different. So if you talk about Europe, so as I mentioned before, public transport is really anchored in federal and state law. And then urban planning should be, or has to be in line with the extension of public transport infrastructure. And then of course, given the history of urban development in Europe, the, 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 the urban development is usually much more compact and slower than it was before in Northern America. And if you look on the US side, there's, there are certain developments in the last 60 years, why the systems are, they are right now. So first of all, there was this Federal Highway Act of 1956, which basically put a lot of emphasis on developing road transport, individual road transport highways. And you can see this also, uh, and this also lead of course to urban sprawl because suddenly you have these big highways. So distances was not a matter 
no, not a big matter anymore. And you gain this least rapid urban sprawl. And then you have neighborhoods like this in, in, in the right corner here, where, for example, you have a house here and the school could be only 200 meters away. But in fact, through these uh, developments on road traffic and highways, you have to go around to make your trip, which could be easily over two miles. So then you have very, yes, so it's very inefficient for, um, for public transport to plan routes there and individual transport, motorized transport as a priority in, in this case here. And then there are other certain development political reasons like lack of rail projects really in, in over 40 years in the 50s to 80s, there was not much money spent on, on infrastructure projects. And uh, also in, in general, public transport is more seen as a social welfare. So there's a lot of political discussions and then there's usually uh, um, prioritization of federal and state law, which then you have differences between urban and rural areas. But these are basically the main two differences why uh, public transport developed uh, differently uh, if you compare Europe in this case to North America. And to give you an just just to give you an overview on how this looks like, I, I selected a couple of cities just to compare on the trans transit network. So this first case is Strasbourg in France. You see Strasbourg, the city of around half a million, a half a million to uh, six seven hundred thousand people. It's situated on, on the Rhine, uh, connection to, to Germany on the on the on the eastern side of the Rhine, and you see that. Um, this is a typical uh, European uh, transportation network. You have major tram lines, you have these red or bus lines, and nearly every little village is connected um, to tram lines or either the city cars. So, so you even if you go across the borders, so every yeah, neighborhood is really well connected. If you compare this to a similar sized city in the US, this is an example of Omaha, Nebraska, similar size of population, same extent of, of the map as you see with Strasbourg. And you see this, this big urban sprawl, which happened in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, up to the 2000s. There are actually a lot of neighborhoods which had no service at all. So developing a public transport system is, and with less, less priority, it's very hard. And that's why you see these big differences, for example, between uh, Europe and, and, and Northern America. The same if you go to bigger cities, you have Paris. Also in Paris, you have quite a few new developments in the outer part, but these, even these new developments here, they are really well uh, connected and uh, you usually find stations, bus stations or tram stations uh, within a couple of hundred meters from your location. If you move to a similar city, same size again to the US, you see the same phenomena there. You have only a few uh, tram lines and subway um, and train lines, which are in, in, in green here, and this big urban sprawl around which again is not well well connected um what is interesting about that some denver denver is, it's just it was founded in the late 1800s and in this time actually the us had a higher priority on public transport so there were there were tram lines there were sort of bus lines and you see usually see in older towns or bigger towns in the us that the inner city is was or is still quite developed but the outer part not so there was less priority with this urban sprawl the same last one I just want to give you an overview of is, is here in Berlin. So there are a lot of new developments out, still outside the city. Usually most parts are well um, well covered. And the other extreme would be Atlanta. So Atlanta has the highest um, number of traffic jams worldwide, I guess, I think worldwide, besides some Chinese metropolis. But uh, you can see that nearly all the new developments, they have no access to public transport. And developing services for these is quite different, uh, difficult, and you will see sustainable uh, system differences between these developments. We have more uh, on-demand services in this area, more Uber, more ride-hailing services, and so on. So, if we now move back to Karlsruhe, where I'm located, Karlsruhe, I want to highlight this is a special, special, um, special case because. Um, in Karlsruhe, there was this model developed called Karlsruhe model. And it's actually the, the real name of this model. It was established in 1992. And the main idea between, uh, of this model was basically to move commuters from single car, car usage to public transport. 
And the requirements for that was there should be a direct connection from the rural area to the city center. And this connection should be faster than train and more flexible like a, a tram and a bus. And at the same time, it should use the existing infrastructure. So because they didn't, didn't want to spend too much money on building new railways, for example. So they should use existing infrastructure and combine the tram and rail system. And why did they yeah, put, yeah, why did they push on the rail service and tr uh, tram systems in this case? Because back then there was a survey on commuter train riders and bus riders. And uh, car users um, share on commuter rails are 40% and car users shares on buses are only 5%. So if you think about the individual car user, it seems that the individual car user is more preferable towards trains or rail uh, systems in general. So then the idea was that to develop a model uh, which connects the periphery with the city. Um, sorry. So why, why did you want to use the tram instead of a commuter rail? So the characteristic of a tram is usually that you can accelerate much faster and brake much faster than a train. So if you think about a bigger train, for example, a train that at 160 kilometers per hour needs around two to three kilometers to stop. If you, if you increase the speed, uh, it takes much more time. Of course, a tram can stop within a much shorter time at distance. And um, through this characteristic of faster acceleration and faster braking, you could put, of course, new stops on the line without um, increasing the travel time. And uh, you can also have faster connections on these existing lines, to the city center than on the road, for example, because you don't have any traffic traffic um, on, on the road to, yeah, um, to obey. So, uh, so this model was, in, was put into place that um, the, the, the tram can now run on, on train lines and through the service you have, can include multiple stops on the, on the rural area in the same amount of time to basically get to the city center. And so, so how this develop, developed over time was basically that in 1992, when it started, there was 140 kilometers of tram train service. So this was these original uh, blue lines here. And since, since over the last 25 years, it increased to nearly 600 kilometers. So you can basically run from uh, across an area of nearly 200 kilometers from north to south or um, uh, east, east to west. And this is quite special. And how they did it was basically from the beginning, Karlsruhe had the same um, um, train line width as, as the, the standard train. So you can then run basically the same uh, trains inside the city as outside the city. And basically we have these special trams which have two kinds of systems which run on heavy rail and, and light rail. Um, so how, the, how, that, how did it lead to really getting more attractive? So, over time, it was 10 times more passengers if you compare 1992 to 2019. Um, 70 of these passengers use direct connections, so there's usually no, no changing involved. And 40% of the users have used the car before and now using the tram. And the number one reason basically was convenience to shift from car to tram train. And if you look at the previous mode of transport, why people change to this new, this, this new system, um, um, it's basically a train. People rode train before. Of course, this was these are basically the riders which now shifted from commuter rail to tram train. But car was forty percent. People changing from bus was seventy percent, and new customers were twelve percent. So there, but the major share share was car uses. And over time, this has developed also in other cities besides Karlsruhe in the UK, in Denmark, France, Spain, Italy, and now there's also development in Australia. And also uh, Portland in the US has a tram train system. So you can see that this is quite a popular model. And um, yeah, it's, it's to make a public transport uh, more attractive. So now moving away from the general idea of trans public transport and what trans public transport con consists of and what concepts have been developed to more the technology side, sensors and data, what is being collected um, on public transport. So public transport is, is really a logistical challenge. You have uh, lots of different kinds of vehicles. You have 
high frequency of usage. You have lots of data coming from all kinds of sources. And public transport can be divided into, into planning, right? You need to need a net network for public transport. You need uh, a schedule service. You need to serve the population. You have um, by law and, public and, and uh, federal law, you have a certain mandate to fulfill. You have to plan accordingly. Then you have to control and command this whole system. Then you have to manage information and data. Then, of course, you have to sell tickets. You have to uh, manage subscriptions and so on. And in the end, you also have to uh, ensure that quality and safety and everything is, is, is covered. And uh, on the right here, you see an actual picture of a control room. This is from Cologne. But the you major cities look all similar. Um, you have basically this typical control room where you have, have multiple um, exponents uh, working on, on, on different lines, uh, organizing traffic, and you have a yeah, control room similar to air traffic control, I would say. And then if you look at um, technologies and, and, and data or data and, and, uh, and the whole supply chain of, of public transport, so you have usually distinguished um, uh, temporally, so on this scale, and also spatially. So you have the control room, which is located at, at, the, at the corporate office, usually of the PTO or PTA. Then you have data which are collected on the vehicle, and then you have data for the passenger. And at the beginning, you start, of course, with proposal planning. This is network planning. There are timetables. And then you publish this to the customer, the passenger on print media, or nowadays no longer print media, of course, but internet and, and, and road planners and so on. Then you have the operational planning. So this is also quite complex. You have drivers to um, uh, duty planning, block planning. You have to ensure working times and so on. Then you have to make use of resources, right? You have vehicle dispatching and staff deployment. This is quite complex. And then you have this whole uh, area of fare management, which is also quite complex because you have a tariff structure, right? Usually cities have different tariffs. Then you have a fare collection, and this is then connected to ticket sales. In the past, it was more vending machine, ticket printers. Nowadays, it's usually over an app or online. Um, besides that, you have this operation control, which includes data management, and then the control of the whole system via transmission protocols, radio. There are all kinds of different uh, transmission protocols, which transmit data for the driver, for passenger counting, for vehicle control and monitoring to the whole, whole operation side. And then you have in the end this evaluation. So you have to basically make decisions on the actions you have done before to enhance public transport service, for example. And down here, you have this new field of real-time passenger information. So these are all these displays which are managed, all guidance systems, routing systems, apps, and so on, which then informs the passenger where he, he or she has to go and change and so on. So this is a general an ecosystem of of systems which are into place. So if you if you look more in this in this in this data collection operation side, you have in the middle this ITCS system. So ITCS stands for Intermodal Transport Control System. So this is basically the heart of all the public transport operation, and all where all data is gathered and comes together in in a central place. And this data is usually communicated via uh, either data trans radio transmission, 4G, now 5G, uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, voice over IP. So there are multiple uh, choices of communications. And this communication communicates then with the vehicle. So on the vehicle, you have onboard units, you have cameras, you have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth devices, you have vending machines, all sorts of, of, of hardware, uh, which collects data on the vehicle side. On the same side, you have also station, and, and track equipment, which also again, information displays, ticketing machines, and Bluetooth and Wi-Fi for passengers nowadays, usually in most cities. Then of course, from the this, from this central point, ITCS, you have APIs, because usually um, if public transport uh, providers, operators, uh, they have systems from multiple companies, multiple, multiple systems have to be integrated, and there are a number of APIs for data hubs. So usually these systems also connect to smart city hubs of cities. 
the city has to has to get information out of that. There are, there are REST APIs, multiple mobile apps, uh, many, many different protocols and standards for data transmission. It really depends on the usage area you want to, yeah, you want you want to fulfill. Then you have also statistics for reporting. So this is the whole data science field where you do analysis, spatial analysis. There's a lot of GIS also involved in that. Um, accounting, ticketing, and business management. And then in the last one is the planning management. So this is the whole depot management, transport management systems, personal planning, and so and so on. So this is a whole area by itself, and everything comes together in the central database, basically. So this is the, the main database where everything connects to. So now, if we if we move to the vehicle, because this might be interesting also for research, because you have a sensor basically moving through a city, so you can collect many parameters, environmental parameters, environmental parameters about mobility, about movements of people, and so on. So there are a lot of um, sensors installed in the bus or hardware installed. In the bus. So if you look at the at the bus, you will find in, in, this is really a, a standard nowadays a bus with the system. You have usually these passenger counting sensors. So you, next time you ride a bus, you should look, uh, if you enter into the door, you should look uh, up and there should be a little camera, which uh, is the passenger counting sensor. Then you have LED displays, the vending machine. Then you have a passenger terminal, usually an RFID card where you can swipe your, your ticket or your, your smartphone. Then you have uh, different kinds of display. Really depends on what the operator wants, and then you have an onboard unit, onboard computer. So this is basically the hard where the information from the ITTS comes to the to, to the to the vehicle, and then you have different kinds of additions to that for the driver. And on the uh, on the on the station, we have usually a vending machine, uh, monitors, and also nowadays a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, sensors or connections. So. So in this case, you can basically use a lot of, can generate a lot of data, which could be useful for 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 research. So now, if we if we look at 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 sensors and, and and technology a bit more closely, so you have these onboard units. So this is, for example, one of ours, but there are multiple vendors, uh, which manages radio data transmission. It it has a GPS or a specific positioning system installed. It's acting at a com communication gateway, and you can integrate multiple services. Like you can add all kinds of services to that through open APIs, and usually runs Linux or Windows, maybe depending on the priority or the operator. Then you have this this, this other device here called Traffic Signal Priority Request um, Device. So this is basically a device where you can influence uh, the the traffic lights in the city. So most cities nowadays have that, so you can basically give priority to public transport. And there are different kinds of transmission protocols which are used. Really depends on the system the city is, has in place. So this is basically a signal priority, priority uh, for for transport. And then you have these automatic passenger counters, usually an infrared sensor or video sensor, and it counts passengers. The accuracy rate is quite high, and usually the fleets are equipped. Twenty percent of the fleets are equipped, and the rest is then estimated. So with twenty percent, usually you get a good sense of how people, how full your vehicles are and a plan accordingly to that. And then everything comes together. This is some, some screenshots from this uh, control room um, displays. You have usually a map view, you have real-time view of your vehicles, then you have colors for uh, a late arrival, early arrival, you have different displays of, of lines. You basically have, have, have access to all data which is, which, is, which is generated by these devices. Okay, so if we now think about this data which is, is generated, so so far, this data is, I would say, quite untouched so far uh, because it's really locked in. But nowadays, there are more and more um, APIs offered and through the smart cities in initiatives are uh, opening up to use this data for, for research. The thing about this data is really that it's really bound to public trans infrastructure. Usually you have data where people enter a bus or a train and when they exit or if they exit the station, so not more. So usually, if you want to work with this data, you have to uh, add additional sources to to basically uh, yeah to these sources to uh, yeah to, to to inform decisions. So here, I want to now show you some examples of, of of research we've been doing with this kinds of data, and I want to focus on 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 three fields. One is data, the other one is services, and the other one is integration. Um, 
So one example of, of project is uh, the research on, on data, on mobile data fusion. It's a project in Kassel in northern, in central Germany. And the idea of this project is to basically come up with precise data on demand on passenger flow. Because right now, usually have usually have uh, data within the vehicle and you don't know where people are changing. And this is very interesting for passenger information and service level, uh, better customer orientation and, and various design. So uh, what we, the goals were to develop this origin destination matrix matrices and also have this uh, transfer connection where people change the buses. And we want to find out the frequency of use and, and, and come up with information about passenger flows. And this project, we had uh, several lines. We had in total um, eight bus lines and 40 buses equipped with this, uh, 40 bus stops equipped with this and 50 vehicles. And we covered an area of the inner city and very urban and, and rural area. Um, and the idea was to, um, to basically um, come up with these origin destination matrices for better service offer, tariff planning, and, and find out about occupancy levels. So this approach we used was basically we connected different kinds of source data together. So in the past, you usually have this automatic passenger counting data. Uh, um, um, and now we added additional data from Bluetooth and Wi-Fi sensors. This mCloud is an open data platform in Germany for mobility data. And then we also looked at uh, electronic schedule information. It means where people search for trips. So if you enter in, in your app, I want to go from A to B, we have this request in our database and we can then align it with, with the data to find out about behaviors so where people might go in the future, in the near future, next 10 minutes or half an hour. And we use this big data approach. Well, in our case, it's not really big data. It's, it's not about volume, it's about um, um, different quality of data, veracity, and also the, the real-time processing element of, of big data as we, as we merged and uh, used a multiple data source. So what we did on our side, we, we developed this data processing pipeline. If you're familiar with this big data processing pipelines, we used, for example, in this case, an Apache Flink um, uh, backend. And we merge data from the schedule information, from better data, from uh, passenger counting systems, and also about the mobility user and um, the smartphone data location data together. And then we distribute it to different systems where analysis was done uh, later in, in, in the second stage to come up with this origin destination matrix. And how it looked like in the project. So in the first phase, we developed an own sensor based on a Raspberry Pi, where we placed it um, on stations and in a bus for basically Bluetooth and Wi-Fi sniffing. So we only did probe requests on, on the phones and basically to, to identify um, which phones or devices are within the distance of, of the station or the bus. Then in the second phase of the, of the project, we have had to make it, of course, commercially that it also can run in a bus. So we developed our onboard unit further with a custom Linux OS, and then we had to run through a certification because every time you install something on a, on, on a vehicle, you have to have a certification from the European Union that it's approved for, for usage in, in, in vehicles. And we're currently operating these for testing in 21 buses. So how it looks like, um, here's some, some examples of data we generated. So this is the red points you can see here are the number of people entering a bus and the blue lines are basically the number of people exiting the bus. And this is through APC data, this is really standard, but this is just gives you already an idea where you have this high frequency of, of usage. But now if you look at our Bluetooth and, and Wi-Fi events, you can see here, for example, a line, uh, the blue represents uh, the Bluetooth and the orange represents the Wi-Fi. You can see that we have different kinds of cover which is, um, yeah, so a number of, of, of devices we are tracking basically. Then if we, if we go in the inner city, you can see differences of Bluetooth and Wi-Fi sniffing events at a different station. And there's also one reason why we use this combined approach of Bluetooth and Wi-Fi uh, event sniffing to cover basically all devices because oftentimes passengers 
only have smartwatch with them, for example, or, smart, or the Wi-Fi is turned off and only the smartwatch is on. So we have to fill a lot of, we have to do a lot of filtering and to, to track these events. Another thing you will find in the cities, you see all lots of events here on the street and both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. This is because the bus runs on the street and then if, for example, a car drives alongside the bus, you will track the car. Or if you drive along um, houses, the smart TV, for example, or your own Wi-Fi, you pick up the signals. So we had to develop filtering algorithms to filter out these, these, these disturbances. And then another big thing, what, what was done in this project was that we implemented this privacy on design approach that we use anonymization before the data gets stored because this was one mandatory, um, was mandatory in order not to track single persons. And, and then at different levels of analysis, we, um, yeah, we had to anonymize the data and aggregate the data. We also included a blacklist where people can opt out if they don't want to be tracked. In, in the bus. And then what is currently going on, as this project is going on, we're building these destination, source destination matrices. And you basically can then track passengers online so far, where they enter and where they exit. And this has to, this will now be enhanced with connections. So where people change from one line to another. So this is one example of, of data, how data data is is how we make use of additional data data in, in this case. Another research we're doing in the same area of Kassel, this is the same, nearly the same partners, is to look at, um, at um, occupancy data. So how full are these buses and trains and, and how can this predict it? And this is especially now um, relevant in times of COVID because people like to tend to use basically buses which are less full or this is also an, topic of if you have big events, how to plan accordingly to find out um, about the occupancy levels of, of, of the buses. So usually you, um, you have two stages of forecasting here, the long-term forecast, which is uh, which, which um, historical data of comparable trips are compared, and then the short-term forecast, which is of course interesting for the, for the user. So if you stand on a line on, on, on a stop and want to see if the next bus, bus is full or not, so you need this, this short, short term forecasting capability. And usually we have this real time at the control center because they need to know how many people are in the bus right now. But the, pass, the, the, the passenger only needs to know the, about the forecast because he wants to know if, if the next bus or, or train uh, full, too full for my, for my convenience and so on. And what we did here is we developed different kinds of occupancy levels. So they are based on standards. VDV is one standard for public transport of, um, operations. And we selected, for example, different categories. A is, for example, 50% of seats are taken, zero standing room is taken. B is, for example, 50 to 100 and so on. And uh, the last group, uh, we decided that people won't be traveling if you have 85% of total capacity. So this is basically a specification from the manufacturer. And then we, their partners developed the display where you show basically the occupancy level on the, on, on, on this, on the signaling of the, of, of the tram stop in this case, the train stop. And for that, we use this automatic passenger counting system. I showed you this before. So next time if you ride the bus, uh, please look upstairs, uh, uh, please look up uh, in the door panel. You will see this camera, I'm pretty sure. Um, it's basically an, an, um, an object recognition. Um, um, uh, software um, uh, to basically detect uh, classes of of yeah of passengers. So this is how it looks like. This camera can detect. You can detect bicycles. You can detect um, uh, persons. You can also know when this person with object recognition enters or leaves the, the bus again. And uh, you get usually with this kind of technology 80% accuracy. And this is based on in infrared. So what we're doing in this project is basically apply um, uh, uh, object recognition for this for detecting the multi multiple multi-purpose area measurements. This is especially important for bike if you want to take your bike or you or you're on a wheelchair, for example, and want to see how full these spaces are. So we we have this pipeline for basically detecting the objects in the in the bus and also tracking these objects while they are in the bus and when they're exiting. And based on this, uh, we're developing these pictograms that they can be shown in an app. 
these the red dot, the three dots basically mean that we have not decided yet on how to show the different levels and they're still, still currently um, ongoing. So what we are basically looking right now is um, looking at the multiple, multiple surface measurement and how to basically present this uh, pictograms to bus stop displays and timetable information at. And uh, basically have this participative approach uh, with the University of Kassel on meaningful ic icons and how to develop these. But what is currently already done is to include this in the control room, basically. You have these occupancy levels in real time in this, in this system and also for usage as a map view in the control room. And then there are currently developments on how to use this uh, at different modes of visualization. One is in the app, this is our own app, and there are multiple other apps uh, which provide these kinds of information. And you see basically the occupancy levels in there. And there are also new developments you to display this as LEDs in the on the ground. So this is quite popular right now, especially in times of pandemic that people are interested in seeing where the train is empty and where in which area is it already occupied. So this is currently an idea of one company and we, yeah, we're trying to include this too. So this is, this is quite a quite interesting development. Yes. And this is still going on, ongoing research and this algorithm has to be adapted, of course, to this multiple purpose areas. And there will be a 12 months test phase in the research project from fall 2020. And there will be additional sources of data merged to that too, like to find out for forecasting about uh, weather data and also event data like concerts and exhibitions and so on to include them. Okay, so I have, uh, yeah, I have like 15 minutes left, so I will do a bit faster now, I'm sorry about that, uh, to look over about mass. So what is mobility as a service? You are the topic on, on services now, I have left data to mass. So mass is basically mobility as a service. To, to offer, yeah, mobility services. Yeah, this can be any kinds of services from car hailing to bike sharing to park and ride and so on. And why is this important? Why to look at mobility as a service in general? And there you have to look at the, the model share or how people are using mobility. This is an example from Germany in this case, but I think you can adopt it to other European um, countries in 2010. And number of shared trips by car is 55% compared to 2% or 9% and uh, for public transport. So there's a high, high uh, share on individualized motor, motorized traffic and how to get basically these people who are riding uh, motorized transport um, away from individual transport to public transport, how to make this more, more attractive. And this goes, I think, across the European Union. If you look at rail infrastructure in, 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 in Germany, for example, it's decreasing or still decreasing. And at the same time, uh, roads are still expanding and number of cars are expanding. And investments, if you look at, look, look, look in the case of Germany, there's nearly 20 million euros, uh, t t sorry, 20,000 million euros um, 2011 for roads and only six and a half million, 6,500 million uh, for rail. So it's still actually decreasing, but now with the new bill, this is gaining more traction again. So it's a good sign, thing, but still there's a lot of uh, focus on, on motorized um, uh, transport, individual transport. And what is actually influencing your mobility behavior? I'm pretty sure you, you and Tatu, you know pretty well about this because it's of your study area, of course. Um, well, there are internal conditions and external conditions. So internal conditions could be seen as uh, flexible mobility is still based on individual motorized transport because people have this perception that, of course, the car is still very individual, right? And you can go from A to B the way you want it and how you want it. And yeah, and there's increased mobility demand. And there's also external condition, conditions like change of labor force from industry to services, home office now, of course, is changing. And external conditions like climate change, people are getting more aware about this too, demographics, changing income structure, and so on. So these are basically two conditions too. And there are new forms of mobility like car sharing, taxi, long distance buses, e-bikes, e-cooling, and so on. And there's already high system integration of these systems in urban areas. And it gets more and more complex too make these choices. You have multiple choices, what's the best choice to take? And the possible solution to that is um, taking away the uh, complexity 
of this booking process to intelligent, let's say, intelligent travel information systems. And mask could be, for example, one way to deal with this, uh, yeah, with this complexity in offering um, integration of more, all mobility offers in a region, in a region to one information system for planning, booking of intermodal travel change. So if you look at mass, people use mass, I would say, across all kinds of different um, yeah, topics. So usually in mass, you, you distinguish between mobility as a service, mobility platform, and the mass app. So most people, if they think about mass, refer to mass app, but mobility service, is actually the concept of integrating different mobility services into one solution. And then the mobility platform is the technology to do that. And the app is just the front end that combines all these services. And mobility service is not only about technical integration, but also about contracting. So you have to put in together multiple P PTOs, multiple mobility providers, and so on into one into one platform. And usually, if you look about definitions of mobility service, you find page long <laughs> uh, definitions of mass. One I like is from the Smart City Initiative, Netherlands. Mobility as a service stands for the transition to mobility where a consumer buys in mobility instead of investigating and transport equipment. So you offer basically a service. So what is the current situation uh, or in 2019? So nowadays, usually if you go to a new city, you want to take the bus, the tram, then a taxi and a bike share system, you have to have different accounts, it, uh, payment is handled differently and it's quite complex. So the idea of a mass system is basically provide all that in one single application or website or one account. So you have one account and you can book across the mode of transport all choices. The only thing that matters is where to go from A to B. And the mode of transport is secondary and should be all included within um, um, the mass app. And you have one single point of access and you, will you can integrate all kinds of, of, of systems. It also includes planning and booking and the payment. And a big part of this of mass in general is active mobility as a basis. So you will usually always have inclusion of, of bike share systems, scooters sharing systems in there for the last and first mile. And then if you look at these mass applications, there are different levels of, of, of integration. So one zero, basically no integration is basically you have, as, as you have nowadays quite often, you have multiple apps or one app for one service. Then this moves up uh, to integration to full integration, where you have uh, integration also of societal goals, governance and public um, uh, cooperation. So the idea is basically to offer with this mass integration to offer one phase for all services with, with description and so on and, and, and single, user, uh, single, um, single interface, single account. So if you look at the mass ecosystem, as I mentioned before, you will have multiple choices of transport. They are all connected to one uh, in, yeah, platform, which has an app front end and ticketing system uh, and control system basically for your, for your preferences and a payment provider. So you should be able to use all these services in the future with, with basically one one phase, I would say, one, one, one front phase without, without worrying all the other services which are in, included in this app. But of course, this, apps ha this, this ecosystem has some boundaries, right? You cannot integrate everything or sometimes it's not easy to integrate. And this really depends on the city. So it's really a case study or city specific. It depends on political strategy, on if you have more tourist, more computer patterns, mobility behavior. So this has to be, these are factors which influences the, uh, the mobility as a service platform. Then on the other hand, you have policies and law, uh, how to manage, uh, what is the goal of the city, how it would like to achieve, uh, the and, 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 and should be in line with these SUMS, SMART, the Sustainable Urban Mobility Plans, which are now mandated by the European Union that most cities should, or cities should have these plans. And then a big, uh, and, and a big part in that is these contracts, how to, how to manage these accounts, how is this data transferred, how to uh, protect data, data and privacy laws and so on. And then you also need physical infrastructure, which is usually quite costly. So if you have a bad uh, public transport infrastructure in place, 
the mass won't basically help. Well, we can help improving the system, but it will not transform it because you usually need some kind of infrastructure. And then you have also the spatial context, so urban versus, versus peri-urban versus rural, but there are quite a big differences in there too and how to offer these systems. So what we have done in, in terms of research on that, as we have, um, there was a research project uh, called RegioMove, which uh, was a research project and now it's a product basically uh, from the state of Baden-Württemberg and European Union, uh, basically to build a mobility um, mass system with a deep integration. So you can basically select, you go from A to B and book your car sharing, your, uh, your bike sharing, your public transport, all modes of transport within one place. So this was quite a lot of um, effort, especially the contractual side on that, on how to integrate everything together. And uh, as I mentioned before, the key features of that were that all mobility providers are in one app. It's a deep integration. It covers the whole region and will now ex extend to, uh, to another region. And you only need to register one time. You have the subscription. You can link accounts. This is also very important. If you already have a bike scooter, a car sharing account, it should be linkable. And you should have intermodal access uh, to that and also the history and how on what you have, have done. And so this model of, of, of mass, you can, yeah, new developments, uh, yeah, new, new tariff products can be generated and so on. So, that, so there's this quite a, yeah can act as a, as a, base, a basis for, for future development. Um, one question, Arge, how much time do I have? Because I, I was off, um, because I, I have one, one another topic, I could uh, have five minutes on it and then I'm done. Oh, all right, then we will have a shorter um, discussion section. Okay, so the last topic um, I, I can give a short overview is the integration of, of services or new integration which which people have yeah which which is not yet done or has not been done and this is an example of a, of a, of, of a research project we've been doing to integrate uh, cargo and delivery services into public transport and tram services and you might notice you know the, the a lot of since covid especially an amazon hype my right, people are buying a lot uh, post, uh, via delivering services even food and so on and why not use existing public transport to integrate it in there and not have this lots of delivery trucks in the city. And this is also a big problem. It's polluting the cities and so on. And the idea is to use the existing rail infrastructure to basically um, to deliver packages into the city and have the solution as the entire supply chain from outside the, the distribution centers of the big um, uh, delivery um, companies like FedEx, DHL, UPS, to use the tram as a mode of transport to the city. And then the city, you have a last mile uh, delivering service, which delivers the packages to the customer. And this is, was the basis on how this project was developed. It, it, there was a survey done before that, how much uh, are people in Karlsruhe or in Southern Germany uh, um, accepting to pay more for eco-friendly delivery method. And the consensus was one to two euros and the same, how much longer would you wait for eco-friendly delivery method and the average was two days. So this was the, the basis on how to develop this, this project because if you use the tram, you're of course less flexible than individual motorized transport. You still have to say that and it needs a bit more planning and time to, 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 to get the package that environmentally way, way to the city center. So the main idea is that you have a hub distribution center uh, in the urban hinterland. You use the tram on the on the train line into the, the, the city, on the tram line to the city center. And there you have automatic handling processes and logistics hubs, which this which transports these packages further. And this idea is quite a large project actually um, to implement um, um, this whole system in, in the city of Karlsruhe from the IT infrastructure to last mile infrastructure to IT uh, logistics and also participation, what the citizens actually want to want to have. Um, the system is not new. This was this, these trams existed already 100 years ago, but over time and and you can see here an example of the marketplace where people used um, used this as a mean to transport goods in inner city. 
There are other projects in Vienna, for example, which they tried out big, uh, um, uh, big delivery me methods in the city, and also in France in Saint Etienne for grocery uh, supply supply chain in the tram. And here's another example of Frankfurt where they integrate this with this uh, new, uh, new new bike uh, delivery service. Um, um, yes, but over time. Um, uh, this this got of course as these systems existed before, but over time of course motorized um, uh, truck delivery methods were of course a higher higher priority. You got more funding, and if you look in the case of Germany, that um, there were lost three thousand four hundred four thousand kilometers of track were lost basically since nineteen ninety four since the the train was transformed from the state company to a private private uh, company basically. And this also led, of course, of less prioritization on rail traffic. But in this project, what, what we're doing there is basically developing a logistics and operation concept and developing the IT infrastructure for this, um, for, this deliver, for enabling delivery services on, on, on trams, basically. And um, the idea is basically to have an, a platform which has a booking platform, a handling, monitoring, and this accounting um, in included. And in this project, we are we having test tests from outside the city inside into the city center, where we include a whole uh, chain of of the packages arrives at the train train station, goes into the tram and outside the train tram station again. And we have to provide interfaces basically to logistics and to public transport operations. And there we have we've made different concepts on how to include these delivering services. Um, Several partners developed this carriage where you can hook this up on on on, an, on a bike and then store it also inside the inside the tram. And then we from Init we're basically developing the IT infrastructure where you connect like logistics um, um, backends to public transport backends to tracking backends. And this is quite a challenging process because there are no standards and some standards exist but they don't work with other standards. So it's quite Quite, quite difficult. And the most challenging part of this project is that there's no legal basis because officially you are not allowed to transport goods and, and, and passengers in the same vehicle. So there has to be some legal changes. Then there's a lot of complexity of mix versus uh, passenger traffic. There are priorities on passenger service, of course. So how do you handle, handle a cargo transport in this case and how to integrate this in the system? And then there's no standards and logistics connection to public transport yet. And also if you talk to delivery companies, they don't work with open standards. They all have closed systems. So every, every um, provider like EHL, FedEx, UPS have their own scanning hardware, their own system. So that's very difficult to connect to and to provide one API that it can be included in the public transport. So how does the future of that uh, public transit look like? Well, it's, it's quite a challenge, I would say, to answer this to, uh, because public transport is essential, I would say, in reaching the climate goals and for mitigating climate change and environment pollution, because a lot of infrastructure is already in place. And as technology advances, public transport will adapt or has to adapt. And there's always a huge uh, similarity between development, automotive, IoT, and energy to public transport. And there's also a mismatch, especially in public transport, between innovation and regulation policies and law. Because uh, as, as you've seen, public transport is really fundamental uh, service and has to, yeah, is bounded by policies and law. And data and services will be a key element. And well, the reuse of infrastructure and bundling of services, I think is the future because it's already there and you can combine these. So now I'm coming to an end. <laughs> Sorry, I took a bit longer and um, open for discussions and questions for the last minute. Thank you. Thank you, Jochen, uh, for this very great talk and then deep insight into the contemporary public transit uh, uh, systems and operations and management and all those uh, data systems, sensors and um, innov innovations uh, that, that lie within this field. Uh, it's not very often that we that we can see such a glimpse or can see this this field so deeply. So th thank you for this great overview. 
Uh, and indeed, you opened with those uh, the, the challenges of public standards as well as uh, or the or the lack of open standards uh, mm -hmm. for for those kind of cargo systems, uh, delivery systems. I think the same is there with uh, the mass system, mm -hmm. and 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 also that um, these eco delivery systems that you described these need a critical mass and and uh, and perhaps quite a lot of change also in the practices of those different operators. But at the same time, while our uh, purchasing behavior changes, we are delivering more and more goods online. So, so also, of course, the more goods are de delivered in those low carbon uh, ways, uh, the bigger the impact is or the avoided harm. So, so in the city centers, this, these services seem to be um, more like of, a, of an economy choice than than only a value choice, value based choice. But in relation to that, actually, what I wanted to ask you now um, is about um, the the balance between public spending uh, and and uh, the interest of the companies in this field of um, of innovative public transit, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, shared mobility, of mass uh, systems. So traditionally. Uh, conventional public transit systems are supported or dotated by the public sector, but for example, shared mobility services are not. We talk about maybe e-scooters, for example, or, or these kind of cargo deliveries. So how do you see the, the future in this field? So where does the public sector responsibility stop to ensure accessibility for all uh, and, and for all social groups and all spatial groups? And, and where or, or how or should it be enlarged also to the playground of uh, of companies of pr private sector mm -hmm. that's an interesting question yeah especially uh, given that as you mentioned public transport right it's fundamental and, and where to stop here with with, with, with these delivery services for example this is something well for delivery services I can say that this is in discussion right I, can't, I have no answer actually for this because we're, we're doing this in, the, in, in this project um, for mass systems um, so you're referring to mass systems really for the then the last and first mile right the e-scooters the bike sharing yes system. yeah the last and first mile but, but also all the information system ticketing um, routing and 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 those things that that are part of the mass system. So mm -hmm. as, as both public services, private services are covered in the mass system, but who is the owner of the mass system? Who runs it? Or can there be tenders for this? Or what is the, yeah, what is the share mm -hmm. of responsibility in this field? Mm -hmm. For this, for, this uh, for mass systems in, in, in general, this is run by a public company, right? I mean, current, current situation. Um, for including this into public transport. There has been recently public tenders for that, especially in, I know from Germany, I cannot speak for other countries right now, but this is, this is still now coming up. But currently, this is still operated as public uh, and public companies, yes. In the future, this might change, yes. We, I don't know yet. Yeah, I, I don't have a clear answer to that, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> Yes, yeah, certainly a field of the future, and we don't have so much practice yet. And, and it depends, I think, also on the population density. So where does it make a business case and where not? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, our audience here, do you have any questions you'd like to ask? I have one question. At first, a comment about this uh, system of the delivery system to join to this um, public transit, uh, I, I feel that it's a really good idea to do so because all the infrastructure is uh, already available or can you can use for other purposes also. But the question is about that, uh, have you also uh, tried or analyzed the data, what is, uh, who, who is using the mass system if you have, uh, uh, have it available already more than a year? But have you also analyzed that uh, who are the people who, who are using this 
are they younger or older or I, I mean that this perspective that mm -hmm. is it available for all social groups or is it that the users are more concentrated for some sort of group who anyway use the public transit mm -hmm. so up to now you're right this, this, the systems are more more targeted not targeted but the users are usually younger generation, well educated, which are already using public transport. But we also see that um, new user groups are joining to that because suddenly you are able to use the services much easier, right? Before that, you really had to be a frequent public transport user, right? You had to know about uh, what existed in the city. But now with these combined services, it enables new users. To, to use these systems, yes, I would say. But currently it's still the younger generation, younger, well-educated, which already uses these systems, at mm -hmm. least for the cultural case, yes. Yeah. I think it's normal that if it's like, uh, uh, now the elderly don't use it, but if it's time goes on, then it's more like people are used to that, this uh, younger people get older and is uh, used to use this. Mm -hmm. And I have the other question, not the question, but just to, for discussion that uh, is it possible somehow to also integrate the car companies somehow to this uh, mass system by renting the car or, or somehow not on a, like you don't have to uh, buy your car yourself, but, but you have mm -hmm. use in some ways uh, to in relation to this uh, mass system, if you use it in most of mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. It's actually interesting. Yeah, these systems exist, but they will, they're not integrated with public transport because what I understand is that um, they, have, they have a different uh, business model behind it. So car companies like Volkswagen and, uh, and BMW, for example, I know from the German case, have these systems into place, but only for their vehicles. And I think I'm not, I would ask, I have to ask my colleague about that, is that they're not willing to integrate this into public transport yet, unfortunately, but this would be one idea yet, but it's a different business case for them. Yeah, I understand it's very, very difficult to uh, join all these different mm -hmm. uh, private uh, companies and what, what they would like to <laughs> earn yes. the money for this and how to do this, but thank you. Maybe I have one more question, or I have several, Johan, but mm -hmm. we have to take them another time. But maybe one question about uh, uh, public transit and, and the, also the experience of your own company, or, or how should it be done? So you were talking also about schedules and, and, and timetables and all those, all those, like the spatial network of public transit system. Uh, and those uh, networks and connections are normally made on long-term user rates or user behavior, how mm -hmm. much demand there is. And of course, if there's less demand, people use more cars, then there is also like a trend to, to cancel some of those lines. But actually, what about irregular use of uh, public transit or irregular demand for public transit? And how can contem contemporary uh, data models, prediction systems, uh, foresee that at certain time, at certain uh, date, there will be there will be bigger demand because there is a concert of a pop star, or mm -hmm. a tourist uh, like a big ferry lands, and 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 mm -hmm. people need uh, more public transit. So can those new can those public company public transit companies predict and provide uh, more public transit based on irregular demand? Mm -hmm. So these possibilities exist, and in some cities they are already in place. So, but then they have the flexibility of basically in the tram you can add a second car, right? So you have double basically the, the capacity of, of one train, or you have additional buses placed in one line. So, the, uh, so there are ways to analyze this, but it's still I would say at the early stage because we need to connect with other systems, right? So the idea of smart city. So in this research project, we have the idea to connect to weather and, and also um, event data, like concerts you mentioned, and then it will be possible to, to, not, to, to, um, to enhance capacity on existing lines, but changing the schedule will be very hard because it's a very complex system. And if you change one thing, the whole system changes. 
the only way to do that is basically adding more more capacity to 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 one vehicle or one one yeah one train or a bus bus or have multiple buses behind it. And there are new concepts now, more under research. Is this is this you can see in this upper picture here? Is, is this pods or this auto, don't they, they don't have, they don't have to be necessarily automatic? But there's this idea of coupling systems, right? You can the idea is you have autonomous transport, which then couples to existing public transport vehicles, you know, automatically. So this is the, the future, basically. We have this, this flexible transport. But, sh but schedules to change is quite complex because if you run, for example, in Karlsruhe or in other cities, you, you run the tram also on train lines. So on train lines, there's a train operator and then the train infrastructure manager, which manages the tracks and the slots. And then you usually make once a year a reservation for a slot and you cannot change the slot anymore because it's very costly. So you're very stuck to this scheduling concept, but you can make ch make changes to the capacity. Capacity, I think that's the only way right now you can add vehicles or wagons to that system. Yeah. Yeah, certainly that, that sounds, sounds logical. And indeed when there is when there is a shared space or shared environment for different uh, types of mobility, then we, we then we all have also we need to respect the other modes uh, running on the same tracks in, in that case, of course, as well. And, and this is really already a high like a complex demand to to host both tram trails and normal uh, trains mm -hmm. and, and uh, maybe cargo trains uh, on the same rails. So, Johan, uh, I would like to thank you once more uh, for your lecture today. We are very, very grateful for you to, for, for giving this lecture. And we also would like to thank our audience uh, who have been with us uh, throughout the whole uh, lecture series, those 11 uh, e events. And uh, as the previous ones, the recording of this lecture will be also available for you uh, in, in a few days latest. So thank you. We close the session for today now and uh, goodbye. Thank you again. And sorry for the technical difficulties. That's fine. No worries. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.